Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is born today. While Mary, his mother, and her betrothed husband were in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. She gives birth to her firstborn son, lays him in a manger because there's no room for them in the inn. And as we just sang, the angels appear to him. The angels appear rather not to him, but to the shepherds who are washing their flocks by night and tell them, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's what makes today the holy day that it is. It's not just that a child is born. It's that the child who is born is Savior. Humanity's Savior. Our Savior from our sin and from its eternal punishments. This is why the angel had told Joseph in a dream before the child's birth, You shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. But he's not only Savior. He is Christ, Messiah, the Lord. He is the Messiah who is the Lord God. This child isn't a mere man, as every other child is that is born. He is Christ the Lord. This child wasn't conceived in the natural way, as which everyone else has been conceived from the time of Adam and Eve. He is the one of whom Isaiah spoke about. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. This child isn't God with us, like he was with Israel in the pillar of fire and cloud, or in the tabernacle, or in the temple. No, he's God with us because he is God in our very human flesh. He has come down himself from heaven to put on our flesh so that he might bear our sins and all that we deserve for them. St. John says it this way in the beginning of his gospel, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of God becomes flesh human body, human soul. He takes up our full humanity without sin to be our Savior. And so that John makes sure that we understand that this isn't just any child that is born, he tells us precisely who he means by the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word of God, fully divine, but distinct from God, because he was with God, he says at the end of the reading, the only begotten of the Father. And so the word of God is his Son, begotten from all eternity. That means there's never been a time when God wasn't Father, and that he did not have an eternal son, his word. His word was present at the creation, and all things were made through him, St. John tells us. He's not creation, he's creator. And not only did he create all things, but he keeps all things going to this very day, and will keep things going until the very last day. For St. Paul says to the Athenians, in him we live and move and have our being. Even after mankind's fall into the darkness of sin, which separates us from God, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Even though his creation fell into the darkness of sin and death, he sustains his creation, though they do not know it. He sent prophets to his creation to proclaim the coming of the light. And today we celebrate his enfleshment. The enfleshment, the incarnation of the eternal word, the only begotten Son of God the Father Almighty. The word by whom all things were made, who assumes our human flesh with all of its frailty, all of its weakness, so that he might be Savior from sin. He lives up to that title of Savior by suffering the punishment that you and I deserve for all of our sins and not just for our sins, but for the sins of the entire world, from Adam's sin all the way to the last child born on the last day. No one can die for another's sins. 
No one can pay for anyone else's sins. The psalmist says in Psalm 49, verse 7, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. And so God, with us, suffered for us in his flesh, died for us in the flesh, so that his death might make infinite payment for all of our sins. It's, it earns infinite forgiveness for all who trust in him because it is an infinite merit, because it is the death of the Son of God. Luther wrote, We Christians should know that if God is not in the scale to give it weight, we on our side sink to the ground. I mean it in this way, if it cannot be said that God died for us, but only a man, we are lost. But if God's dead, and a dead God lie in the balance, his side goes up and ours, or his side goes down and ours goes up like a light and empty scale. Yet he can also readily go up again or leap out of the scale. But he could not sit on the scale unless he had become a man like us. So that it could be called God's dying, God's martyrdom, God's blood, and God's death. For God in his own nature cannot die. But now that God and man are united in one person, it is called God's death when the man dies who is one substance or one person with God. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us to show us the grace and the truth of God the Father. That he does not want our everlasting punishment, but that he desires that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He shows us that he's long-suffering toward us, not that, willing not that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And yet, we see in our own time that not all are saved. And St. John explains this as well, as many do not want to come to the knowledge of the truth through repentance and without Christ. For St. John writes, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. He came to his own, the Jews, and they rejected him, many of them did anyway. And he still now comes to all men through the preaching of the gospel, and still, as in the days of his flesh on earth, many, if not most, reject him still. Even though the world was made through him, and he continually sustains it, they know him not. And sadly, they judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life by their unbelief in the Savior, Christ the Lord. But, John says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To receive him means to believe that he is fully God as well as fully man, and that his sufferings and death pay for all of our sins. To all who receive him in this true faith, he gives the right to become children of God. And that's the gospel. It's that simple. The Son of God became a Son of Man, so that sons of men, by faith in Christ Jesus, might become sons of God. As St. Paul reminds us in Galatians 3, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. God the Father so graciously forgives us all of our sins for Jesus' sake. He gives to us the robe of Christ's perfect righteousness to wear as our daily dress. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can bear witness in our hearts that we are indeed sons of God. And if sons of God, then co-heirs with him of all the heavenly blessings. All of that is why the word became flesh. So that we might become sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And co-heirs with him of every heavenly blessing. Christ is born today. The son of Mary is also the eternal son of God who came to bear all of our sins and be our savior. May God grant us such faith to believe this always, so that we may be called and live as children of God through faith in Christ Jesus all our days, our Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, 
which far surpasses all human understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.